wouldn't say that, man. But, uh, but I'll give it a go. That's fine. But uh, Adam, thank you for coming on. It really is appreciated that you take the time out of your day uh, to speak to myself. Uh, it is appreciated. But first of all, how are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. It's uh, yeah, it's like a weird time at the moment because obviously we're in um, debut album campaign right now. Yeah. So it's. Um, you know, you, sh- you should really be enjoying it. I should sit here and say, oh, it's amazing, everything's great, you know what I mean? And I'm about to buy a Lamborghini or something. But um, the reality is that it is a lot of stress still. And as an independent artist, we we take all that financial and um, all the pressure, like, just on us. But it is fun, man. Like, we're enjoying it. Like, it, it's uh, it's a bit scary. But we're good, man. I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Hopefully what I'll do is I'll make this a wee bit more interesting because I'm sure... You, if you're doing a lot of interviews, you'll probably get asked the same questions all the time. So with it being a podcast, we'll hopefully be able to maybe speak about things that normally you wouldn't probably touch on. Uh, so yeah. it's hopefully a wee bit more interesting for yourself. But uh, see, going right back to the very beginning, Adam, obviously you're only speaking for yourself. So we'll talk about the band in a wee bit. But for yourself, Adam, where were you born and brought up? I was uh, born and bred in a city on the south coast called Portsmouth. Um, we have a there's a local saying here, which is uh, Portsmouth born and bred, strong in arm, thick in head, and uh, it kind of is very accurate for the people that live here. Um, and uh, that's not in no way an insult. It's just we're built for less creative things, put it that way. And uh, it's a naval town, so there's a lot of you know a lot of. Uh, pride and strength here but um, yeah so growing up here was tough it was tough as a long haired musician walking around and you've got squaddies and sailors that are all too ready to uh, take the mick a little bit um, but I'm, I'm proud to be from here but see uh, see, grown up Adam were you into music from a, a, a very young age yeah I mean like well <clears throat> initially um, I was like pushed by my uh, by my dad into um, sports, like massively into sports, and I played football at um, quite a, I say a, a high level, but I was like playing for county and area and stuff like that. And um, it, I never really enjoyed it. Like I was good at it, but I was like, it, it was what my dad wanted to do. It wasn't what I wanted to do. And um, yeah, from like a young age, I always enjoyed music, and I kind of like you know would secretly like in my room, like you know minor song in front of the mirror you know what I mean as you're getting ready and stuff like that and that's always what I wanted to do and um, later in the end yeah later in sort of like my early teens I found uh, a guitar in the in the attic that used to belong to my mum and my mum doesn't play guitar so I was like why well, is there a guitar up here sort of thing and that's kind of how I got into music it's like that way but uh, yeah it's a big part of my life it is all encompassing really now it's all I live think and breathe I guess yeah. Do you remember um, who were some of the the bands and music artists that you discovered? And, and what age were you probably discovering music for yourself? Uh, cool. I mean, like you know, when I was younger, it was you know the that like um, the emerging like two thousands indie bands were the sort of thing that I was in school and you, you you're listening to and, and you're going home and you're trying to download and stuff like that. And, so that was it, and I, you know, I'd listen to uh, like <laughs> I would put a headphone up my school shirt sleeve and like listen in class like that um, yep. to like the BBC Live Lounge or like an album that we were listening to um, at the time or something like that. And it so yeah, it was just that two thousands like indie sleaze thing that I really got into, and then um, that kind of led into. Uh, looking back in time at the 60s and 70s and and um, yeah I ended up falling in love with like soul music and like the mod scene and, and stuff like that and um, so yeah as a 16 year old when you get your first moped or scooter or whatever I went out and bought a Vespa and a Parker and uh, yeah I was I was I was a strange kid around here I guess <laughs> did you just have a quadrophenia on loop on your uh... Watching well, that. you know what? I got I got into I got into like soul and the mod stuff before I'd even um, watch Quadrophenia. Right. Like it was it was later on in life when I actually well, say later on in life like eighteen nineteen 
I had a girlfriend at the time and, and she, we came home from like a house party or something and it was on the telly and she was like, you ever seen this? And I was like, no. And I was like, I was, I was like more deep diving into like the small faces and um, like Edwin Starr and stuff like that. And it kind of, and obviously I listened to The Who, and, but I'd never seen the film and, 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 and got into the, that album that way. Um, but yeah, it was like, you know, I'm glad that I formed that identity to myself and like all my friends that I've kind of grown up with, we were all part of that same scene. Like we, we were kind of a bit of a, um, a bit of a gang really when we were younger. Like one, one of us looked like Rod Stewart and he had like the hair and everything, you know what I mean? And, and it was like, whenever we'd go out, about five, six of us, we, we, you could spot us a mile off, but I'm glad we, we grew a thick skin because you're always getting a yeah. bit of uh, grief. For uh, you know, rocking up to an indie night in a scarf and a pair of Chelsea boots, you know what I mean? At, at the time when everyone's not wearing that, so. Yeah. Um, so you so you found a, a guitar up up the loft. And did you get lessons or were you self-taught? I tried to. I tried to get lessons. Um, I uh, they did lessons at my school, so started and um, very quickly was told by the guitar teacher that. Um, I was never going to pick it up to give it up, and uh, and yeah, I kind of I kind of came home and I remember throwing this guitar just like, and it, this was before like the, the the education system in England definitely let me down because like you know later on in life they found I was autistic and dyslexic and at the time I'm trying to learn guitar I'm autistic and dyslexic and I'm just not getting it because the education side of it and being taught is just not connected with me, so. Um, yeah, I, I, I put the guitar down and I picked it up again a couple of years later when uh, I was like, no, I want to try and do this and I self-taught myself. And um, I did that by a friend of mine who was a big Oasis fan and he, he basically just said, like, Noel has written countless songs using the same four chords, so you can learn 10, 15 songs using the same four chords. And I was like, sweet, I'll, I'll crack on with that then. So, um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm self-taught. As you know, some of the simplest songs are some of the best songs. I mean, some some songs that have lasted 40, 50 years and they're, and they're still as big today as the day they came out. When, you, when you're when you an actual musician, you look at it and you go, that is the, the simplest idea, but it just works. It doesn't need to be technically complicated for it to be great. Yeah. And that's what's great about music. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of like how I... I look at my own career because I'm self-taught and I, I'm, you know, even now, like, we'll be in rehearsals or we'll be writing something or in the studio and I'll, I'll go, what's that chord I'm playing? I don't know what it is. Or someone <laughs> says, play this, and I'm like, I ain't got a clue where that is. Just show me where it is. So I play by feeling and, you know, I, the first time I learned um, sort of the F shape and, like, to bar it, you know, that opened up a world for me because it was like, I can just move the shape up and down the neck and I can... I can play so much that it kind of feels good. So, um, yeah, I'm a bit of a backwards musician, and I play a bit. I play a bit cack-handed as well, so it kind of leads into our sound being a bit unique because I don't play like anybody else, or I haven't, wasn't yeah. taught that. Way. Adam, is it yourself that's singing as well? Yeah, man, for my sins. Yeah. So, how, sins. how did you get into singing? Because I, I mean, I'm a musician myself, and I've got lots of friends that are musicians, met lots of bands, and all that. And, I mean, everybody's got a different way of learning their instrument. Some people go to lessons, some people are self-taught. You, you learn a lot of stuff off of other people. Vocals seems to be the one thing that you either do it or you don't, but nobody seems to know, nobody I know who's a, a singer went to singing lessons. Mm, yeah. It was probably who was the bravest to stand in front of the microphone because somebody had to sing. It was, how, was, how did you get into it? Uh, yeah, sort of like that, but like the, I, I was about um, 14, I think, 14, 15, uh, hadn't learned guitar, uh, did, did, didn't know anything, and I was in the car with my mum, and we were going somewhere, and I can still remember the road we were going down, and I was singing along to a track on the radio, and she turned to me, took her eyes off the road, mind, on a, a bend down a hill, and I remember just thinking, what are you doing? And she turned to me and went, you can actually sing. And I was like, Whoa. and I got all embarrassed, you know what I mean? Because I'm a 14 year old kid, you know what I mean? And um, didn't think nothing more of it. And until later on, you know, in, in my, you know, late teens, 16, 17, where I was like, gonna start a band and do all this. And initially I was in bands and I didn't sing. 
and I started doing backing vocals and I was a better singer than the front man at the time because uh, I could sing differently and I can I could do the vibrato sort of side of things and then when we started our band um, yeah it was kind of like someone's got to sing so you yeah. know, why not do it and you know it doesn't mean I enjoy listening to my own voice I actually cringe every time I hear my own voice I, I hate it but uh it's um, yeah, it's just something you fall into, or you you kind of you step up into the role. Like Gus, who plays bass, he um, he didn't initially sing in the band, but we were like, well, we're doing a lot more harmonies now, so you need to start singing. And he yeah. was like, okay, so he he kind of learnt with us in practice. And Tom, who plays drums, he he does a lot of harmonies with me live as well. So it's he he's always he actually learnt to sing in his um, in a church choir or a school choir. So like he, right. he actually he had a bit of singing in previously, but. Um, yeah, it's just something you fall into. And like, I'll always say in interviews like this, when people say, like, do you enjoy being the front man? I say, absolutely not. I, I don't want to be, I hate it, but it, I'm not that type of person. Huh? I'm saying someone needs to do it. Um, yeah, exactly. And it's, it has to be, uh, yeah, it has to be someone. And um, yeah, it's, unfortunately, it's me. It's a tough one. Like, um, I don't think people realise, like, I mean, with singing, I suppose you, there, there has to be, a level of talent you need to be able to hold a hold a tune um, but there's a huge bit of, of it is pure confidence and bravado and yeah. uh, you know you might not be like that you know if we were to meet in the street but you know to stand in front of a band it's, it's, it's quite a thing to do yeah I always say like when how I kind of disassociate from it is that um, we're performing you're, you're, you're a character, you're a character of yourself. Like, you know, Mick Jagger is not Mick Jagger. He's not walking around his kitchen snake You know what I mean? You're not doing that. So it's your character and you're there to perform. So as soon as I step foot on that stage, that's that's who I am. And and when I'm off stage, I'm kind of a little bit, keep myself to myself and, and I like that anonymity of it and things. But um, yeah, I guess, I guess it's just, you have to have, I guess you have to have a little bit of skill, you have to be able to sing a little bit. But yeah, as you said, it is definitely just a lot of confidence and sometimes that can be knocked. And also singing is, is incredibly physical, it's exhausting, yeah. like it is exhausting. Um, so you have to be kind of, you have to have the mentality that you're going to, you're going to look after yourself and look after your voice a bit. Like, it's in the 70s anymore where you've got people like Robert Plant who could just belt and they can chain smoke and, you know, down whiskey and stuff yeah. like that. That's one in a million singer. That that just doesn't happen. Yeah. Now every singer that you that you work, that I work with or you, you're going to tour with, like, everyone's, like, using steamer backstage and everyone's looking after their, their voice and stuff like that because it's just different. Yeah. But it's funny that you say that, that, it, that it's, a, it's a physical thing because... Um, be playing in bands previously, I was always like a lead guitar. Maybe do a little bit of backing singing, but um, you know, I would do a gig and you you come off of the gig having gave it your best and you know you're feeling okay, and then you look across at the singer who's done the same gig as you and they're drenched in sweat. I mean, and mm. I'm thinking, why are they? They, they look like a, they've done a lot more physical of a performance than myself. But when I switched to doing main vocals. The same thing happened, and you then realise how different it is singing, yeah, yeah, as opposed to backing up everybody else. Yeah, like I'm, after shows, I'm absolutely gone, man. Like I'm gone because you got to remember, like singing is you're just using a muscle, and like you're just constantly using that. So if you're, you know, if, if a song's three minutes, you're probably singing solidly in that for minute minute and a half you know what i mean if there's music in between and stuff like that so it's a if you're doing like a 60 to 90 minute show you can probably say that 45 minutes of that you're singing so it's like yeah. it, it, i suppose if you're playing the guitar as well it's just yeah like it, of that. It, it, <laughs> i don't play light guitars either like they are heavy man um and uh yeah so i kind of come off stage and i've got my shoulders aching and like I'm knackered and then you have to you know you remember you have to be there for the fans that come and see you so you drag yourself out of the green room and you go you go speak to people and stuff like that and it's like when actually you, all you want to do is just crash out and um, but yeah I, don't, I, I guess I guess it's just one of those things especially when you're touring you end up doing like 14 15 dates in a row and just it's when you get to like the last day 
like I tend, I tend to get home and I, I like sleep for like a good like 24 hours. Like it's crazy. I'm out. The, the, our management and team, they just know not to contact me because I'm not going to reply. I'm out. Adam, give me, a, give me a laugh then. Tell me, what was the first concert you ever went to? <laughs> the first one that I tell people was the first, first one. It depends whether you want to embarrass yourself or not. <laughs> I'll tell you what, well, I'll tell you both. I'll just take both. So the first one I tell people was uh, 16 years old, uh, a group of us from school. We were still like, in the last year of school. We went to uh, Bournemouth Academy to watch um, the Cortinas. Right. And uh, it royally kicked off, like royally kicked off between Portsmouth and Southampton fans. And it was like, the gig got shut down early. They had like meat wagons backed up to the doors and they were just grabbing people as we got out. And it was like, we were 16, we had school the next day. Yeah. So we were just like, this is, um... and it was like the first time we were like drinking in public. So we had like older brothers with us and stuff like that. But the actual very first gig that I ever went to was uh, when I was very, very young. Um, well, I couldn't have been that young, but my, like, but my mum took me to uh, watch McFly as a kid. So um, that was the first one. I'm always pretty embarrassed to say that, but it's a good security question with like <laughs> with things. <laughs> so obviously, like fast forwarding all the years, the Howlers. How long have they been on the go? Uh, we formed just prior to um, the pandemic in 2020. So our first single was uh, 2019, June, July. So just about four years, four years now. And how did, you, how did, you, how did the band get put together? How did you meet the other guys? So me and Gus, um, we happen to have surnames that are in the second half of the alphabet. So when we went to uni together, we ended up in the, the same uh, course and uh, on, we were on the same course we ended up in the same class so it was like we, we kind of we fell in that way and we ended up like living together in London and, and um, actually we spent the entire entirety of uni just masquerading as a band like people always thought we were a band before we were a band and um, it wasn't until after uni that we went probably wasted those four years so do a band now and um, Tom was actually played in other bands at the time uh, that we used to hang around with and see him we used to go watch his band and he was actually our first choice of drummer, and he initially told us to jog on, because like, we, we had no songs. And um, yeah, it wasn't until like years later, we, we started a band with a different drummer, and then we needed a new drummer, and, and someone said to us, Tom's looking for another band. And we were just like, okay, maybe like that's kind of like the fate moment that it now is the time. So um, yeah, that's kind of how we got started. But yeah, it's a weird one. It's just like, it's, uh, as I said, that we were in like, part of that London scene when we're going around and people are going like when's your, when's your next gig and we're like, oh, wait, like what, are you, what are you talking about like, we haven't even done anything yet but um, I guess it's because we just looked the part and we were always there and we were always like part of the party so yeah. Um, but yeah how, four years how did the band get its name? from a pub as un unimaginative as it gets I used to live in a uh, a flat in um, in Hoxton and um, just off the estate that I lived on was uh, a pub called The Howl at the Moon. And it was kind of where we used to go meet up and uh, have a little band meetings. It's a little Irish slash Aussie sports bar -y type pub. But it's right on the corner and it, we would, me and um, Gus were drinking in there one day. And um, we, I can't remember who it was, me or him, went to the toilet. And it was the first time we'd noticed the huge picture had gone up of Alex Turner stood over the sink looking in the mirror and we were like, that's a bit weird. And then like, you're, you've had a few beers, so you've got like beer goggles on, you're like, that's the same sink, like what's, go like, what's going on? And it turned out to be the pub that they, they filmed um, Why Do You Only Call Me When You're High in it. And um, we were kind of like, ah, well, we're looking for a new band name, so like, like you know, this is... Maybe it's a sign sort of thing. I and mean, obviously that's, it's on the street where Richard Ashcroft walks down in Bittersweet Symphony and stuff like that. So there's a bit of musical history there. And there's like two venues on that street, Hoxton Hall and the Macbeth. So um, yeah, it came from that little pub and uh, which we haven't been back to in years. I, I'm sorry to say, but um, yeah, it's a good little booze at that if ever you get to stop by it. That's good. And um, so the band's been on the go for 
four, five years, right? Yes, yeah. In, in your opinion, what makes the band work? And I don't mean in the terms of success, but what makes the band work? As in, do you have, for example, a band leader? Do you have someone that, you know, one person that steers the ship, which the other guys are happy to kind of get behind and support? How, how, what's the band dynamics like? Yeah, so like any band, there's always going to be someone that uh, steps up to lead. Um, and more often than not, it's the person who is fronting the band or writing the songs. Um, and yeah, that's, so that's me. So it's kind of like um, I'm kind of I, I'm kind of driving for it. But that's not to say the boys don't push and and, and drive equal like, amounts. Like we take it in turns. When I'm when I'm a bit burnt out, they step up and, and things like that. But as a dynamic, we it's completely uh, democratic. And you know, it's we discuss everything together before we do anything. Uh, we've got a wonderful manager who um, we're kind of blessed to have. Um, who it like and you know I kind of I kind of convinced uh, to manage us uh, one night at the hundred club when I was drunk and I called him the wrong name for about twenty minutes and he let me and um, yeah like, I mean like it's difficult to say you know that I do everything and the boys do nothing but in, in, there is so much to do that when you have conviction and when you have the drive for it that you tend to just step up and do it and there's certain things that I can't do. But, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not meaning that uh, everybody everybody will have their part to play, and it, it's yeah. not by any means like a dictatorship. But um, you know, there, usually it works when there's one person leading it, and the others are there to, as you say, step up when they need to step up. You know, they're they're also contributing to the overall package, which is yeah. The I mean, like they, they it's said, I can, I can do it without them, and I wouldn't want to do it without them. Like they, they, one of the biggest things that how we work as a band is because I have, you know, I have autism and I have dyslexia and, and stuff like that. So there's, there's certain times where my brain is working faster than the ability to actually do things, and I have little, you know, times where I, I need time out and I need a meltdown. And they, especially the past couple of years, the boys have really stepped up in their understanding of that and their ability to help me through it and be there and understand that there is times that I need a break so I can actually come back and go like full throttle on things. And that's kind of how we work. It's, you know, we've always said we we have more of a brotherly relationship than we do a bandmate relationship. There's some bands that you, you see and you play alongside and you go, you hate each other. But we're yeah. not like that. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, I've known Gus for eight years, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, we've only ever had one like argument in that time and I've never yeah. had an argument with Tom so it's like the the yeah the dynamic is that I lead it but I, like I can't do it without them so um, it sounds a really good it sounds like a really good band dynamic that's in place which is great for future success down the line as well but yeah. um, talking about the band then how, how do you go about songwriting so for example would, would you come in with an idea, like a version chorus, and would the other guys contribute it, or would you all meet up with nothing planned and figure it out, work it out, or is that a wee bit of both, or did the other guys bring ideas And How do you go about songwriting? Yeah, it's kind of, we do it a bit weirdly, so I'm the primary songwriter just because I, ha I have that creative drive. Um, that's not to say that the boys don't have their creative aspects, but they have their creative moments once I present the framework. I kind of always have said it's kind of like I wheel a skeleton into a room and then they put meat on the bones. But how I tend to, um, I started working with um, the guys in Black Honey um, a couple of years ago now, just to help me do demos, because I'm not uh, technically, uh, like, I don't have the technical knowledge to do demos myself, so it's kind of like I'll sit on Zoom like this and, and we'll, we'll, we'll write stuff together and I'll send files and they'll send files. It, it, it kind of works like that. So we kind of get a song in place and then I bring it into rehearsals, I send it to the boys and go, right boys, what do you think of this? This is just the framework. Um, and then we run with it and we develop it that way and they'll 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 take take things apart or you know, something that they've written we'll take apart and do it again. Um, and that's kind of how we work is that 
I don't try and write a drum bit. I don't try and write a bass line. Mm. I try. I, I stay in my lane, and like, yeah. then I, you know, Tom is an amazing drummer and guitarist and singer and just musician. So when we take a, when we work on a song together, he can really take it in a direction that I wouldn't be able to by myself because he knows he knows instinctively. Okay, this is the beat I'm doing. I want to try and develop it here. And what about if we do this different for the bridge? And these are the chords that it can go to. And um, and Gus, as a bass player, he plays bass like lead guitar. He's he's an, he's an incredible bass player. Incredible. Um, something that was pointed out to we had we had an A and R session with some guys from RCA and the head of the A and R team. He was literally like, "What you're doing on bass is just like it's mad. Like that it shouldn't like a bassist would." Quite happily sit back in the mix, but Gus wants to play his lines, yeah. um, and that that's kind of where we are. And it means that our rhythm section, because it's a three-piece, they're unbelievably tight, and it gives me more space to to focus on singing or developing my guitar over the top of it. Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like a really good um, a good setup if you're kind of coming in with a skeleton of a song, but you have enough confidence in other guys that you present it to them. And you know that whatever they contribute is going to make it that much better. Just elevate the whole thing. Yeah, I, 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 like I said, like we, I don't bring something into the room and say, <clears throat> "This is it. You're playing this." Yeah. Um, it's, it's like we are a band. It's, they're not a backing band, but we are a band. And, yeah, it's, and it's, it's full parts. Yeah, and it's, it's it's you know it comes down to even how we split our rights as well. Like I may write a song, I may do a lot of. The, the framework of the song, but everything split equally down, the, you know, as equal as it can be for three piece. Like, yeah. um, because you know, I I enjoy watching Tom play. I enjoy watching Gus play, and I enjoy watching them bounce off each other. So, yeah. whatever the song I bring in, however I Im imagine it, it always ends up being completely different. Um, it's that's good. tight. It's good though. I had a, a listen to a lot of your stuff across the day. Mm. Uh, and you do have a, a really unique sound. Like, I, I, usually when I listen to bands, I, I try and think to myself, right, who, who does it sound like? But, you know, I, I can see there is influences in there. Like, there is definitely a 70s kind of sound to it. But yeah. there's also, there's, there is also a Britpop sound to it. You know, kind of like, early, there's early U2, there's Ocean Colour scene. There's Primal Scream, there's all, all these types of bands, but you have still managed to kind of create a sound that is still unique. I, I couldn't I couldn't listen to it and go, that sounds like this band. Which yeah. is which is great for you guys. Yeah, we we, we how we kind of describe it is that it's it's authentic to who we are. Um, as a band, we often say we're like a three-way Venn diagram. And uh, there's bits that we link up with each other individually on, and yep. there's bits that we individually like that nobody else likes, but it's that sweet spot in the middle. That is where we are, and that comes from our individual influences. Like, there's nothing worse than when you go watch a band, and they're all dressed like Liam Gallagher, and they're all playing the same guitars as Oasis, and they all, then they sound like Oasis, and you're like, surely one of you has gone, you know what, can we do something a bit different? And like I, I find, you know, not to say you know any of that band, bands that do that are bad or anything like that. I just think it lacks a bit of authenticity because you're not being true to yourself. And uh, I kind of feel, I'm not sorry because you know it's not a horrible thing to say, but I kind of feel like you can give more than you're giving right now. And I, I, I think that some bands, I suppose, they would almost be better forming a, a covers band. Because yeah, I mean, like I they're think I... that good, but it's um, yeah, it's strange. Like, like if I go and see a covers band, I always find it strange because they're, they're playing songs by a band that they love. That's why they they are in this covers band. Part of me always kind of thinks these guys are so unbelievably talented. Could they? I wonder if they wish that they could maybe create something completely mm. new themselves because they've got the talent to do that. Yeah. Than, okay. I, 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 I always find it frustrating when you watch when I watch artists and you watch and you you see a drummer or you see a, a guitarist and you think wow like you are really technically great 
but you're you're in the wrong band or you're or you're doing this and like I can think of a few off the top of my head right now that I'm friends with and I think you are in the wrong band like you are like but yeah I mean like you know bring it back to us like we're we're just who we are it's like when we get in a room and that's how we sound we don't try and sound like anybody else and yeah. so we've crafted this this sound that makes us sound like a seven piece but we're a three piece yeah and you know it's about always wanting to be better and walking off stage every night and going mm, even though the team around you and the people in the crowd are going that was amazing and you know you speak to people at the end and they're like that was great i loved it and if you come off stage and you think you smashed it you didn't like you have to come off stage and you have to think okay that was good but how can we be better and always strive to be better otherwise you're never going to get to the bigger rooms because mm -hmm. um, I always say to people when you watch bands and you see a band, um, you know, they might not be the best band in the world, but they think they are. Yeah. And like, that's kind of, that's the uh, the trick of be being a musician, I guess, is that your, your ability sometimes it doesn't quite meet up to your expectations or your belief um, in what you're doing. And, and we've always been a little bit like, I guess mopey when we come off stage because we're like, oh, I messed up there, I messed up there, and, and yeah. stuff. But and that's all. That's what I love is that we just chat about it and we 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 live it, we breathe it, and we want to be better. And, and um, you know, we're always being better. We had a, we had a moment last year actually where we went on tour with a couple of bands in, in February, March time, April, March, yeah, February to April we were on tour with a lot of bands. Mm -hmm. And um, then the summer we did nothing because we've never ever played a festival. It's still to this day, like going to an album about ever playing a festival. And um, we did our own tour in September. And some of the bands that we played with, they came, they came and saw us, and they were just like, "What have you been doing?" Because like you're, you've gone from like here to here just in the last time that we've seen you. Yeah. Um, and it's just because we we pick up and we learn things from people that we play with, and you play bigger rooms, and you go, "Okay, well this this sounds better here." And how can you get? A academy sized sound or an arena sized sound into a 200 cap venue. Like, yeah. how can you do that? And that's what we've kind of got good at. Um, and yeah, it takes a, it's a long time. It's a lot, it takes a long time and a lot of, pra a lot of practice and thought and, and development. But yeah, a lot, of, a lot of hard work will be involved, but it's all worth it. And, and it's your passion. It's what brought everyone in the band and everyone that works with the band. They're all aiming to make this band as as good as possible. That, that's a big thing. Uh, but Adam, your um, debut album is out on the 17th of May. Yes. It's, it's called What You've Got To Lose To Win It All. I know that the single um, Lady Luck is out just now. Why have you picked that song? We've got two out at the moment. We, we released one the, uh, the other two weeks, two, three weeks ago, uh, called Cowboys Don't Cry as well. But we kind of went, we, the first single was, uh, a song called Lady Luck um, and it wasn't my first choice for the lead single there's a song that's out in a couple of weeks that was my first choice but it was all agreed that was the best song on the album but not to put not to like you know for lack of a better term blow your load straight away so it was like what's the second best song on the album and that wasn't it it wasn't it we were like well okay what's the third best song on the album and it was like we went through this period of of struggling to pick a, the singles because they were all singles right and it was this it was this point where we went oh it's, it's a good thing to have an album where you can you could do more singles it's great you were doing a 15 track album and you know they're all they could all go out and stand you know stand alone but yeah it was the one well, we narrowed down on lady luck because we were kind of like it's fun to play and also it, in terms of how we structured the record, we structured it um, thinking about vinyl and thinking about how would we structure a vinyl and Lady Luck opens the B-side of the vinyl and we were like, great, well that, that kind of is like a sign that way. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a fun little tune. It's a tune that goes back right to the beginning of the band because we, the riff in it, I had for years and it just couldn't, it, I couldn't get it into a song that was good enough. Just couldn't. I'd play it in soundcheck, and you know, Gus would always say to me, "Just give it a rest now, mate. It's not gonna, you know, you're never gonna get there." But I kind of persevered and um, took apart three different songs for different bits: a chorus from here and a verse from there, and 
and uh, put them together in that song. And it's yeah, it's quite fun to play live. So, um, and yeah. How did you go about? How did you record the album? And so, for example, some bands will they'll do the drums first, and then they'll layer the bit, everything on top of it, guitars, bass. Some some bands will go in and they'll and they'll maybe do the rhythm section live, and then do overdubs. How did you go about recording? Uh, we record in like a really modern way. So in a, in an old studio. So we record in a, an old 1960s, 70s studio down in uh, Eastbourne on the South Coast. Just because there's no distractions and like it's right by the sea and you know the whole studio is parquet floored and it's got all you know all the vintage gear you could ever think of and then hope for. Yeah. But we went into there on a 1970s desk and we did the most modern recording you could possibly do out of that, whilst keeping in elements of like you know the, the records that we love. But you know I think any band that smart does rhythm first and builds up builds up there. But how we did it was we we did um, uh, all the drums minus the cymbals and things like that first. So Tom played just the, the toms and the, the and the kick drum, and then we did the cymbals separately so we could mix them all individually. So there's no bleed and it doesn't have that live. Um, so it's kind of a little bit tighter and a little bit more modern, and uh, which is kind of funny to watch a drummer play a track and kind of go like that, and there's no cymbal hit there. Um, but yes, we did that, and then yeah, then bass, and we actually did. A th well, the the record has 15 tracks in it. We recorded 17. I think it was like 16, 17 in um, nine days. So it was it was uh, like something I would never do again because it was insane and like it was just the most ridiculous thing. And I think it, it was four days of drums in the end. Yeah. Um, so it was like everything else was kind of like crammed in and we had to be really good and really tight about it. But um, we're really proud of the record and what we achieved. Even the engineer, who's he's, an, he's a wizard, Christoph, he was like, I've never seen a record produced to that standard in that amount of time, like how quickly you did it. Um, it was crazy. But uh, yeah, looking back at it now, we should, probably should have done way less songs. But um, yeah, it was, a bit, it was like we record in a kind of a weird way, but it suits us. It's a it's a nice problem to have having too many songs or too many ideas. Yeah, I mean, like every musician always says, you know, I wrote 100 or 50 songs for this album. It's like it's not from with me. It's not true. Like I, I wrote, like I'm, I don't just write a song and think, oh, that's in the pile. If it's rubbish, I just go, you know what I mean. I wrote 25 songs that I was happy with. And then uh, in pre-production, we narrowed it down to uh, 20. And then we were like, we can't record 20. Like, we don't have the budget either, like, we can't record 20. So, and then um, we actually settled on 15. And we were going to do a 12-song album. Right. And then um, in the studio, it just kept getting, OK, let's do this song and let's do that song. And, like, we had, like, this, the chart. And it started off as... Uh, this thing has started off as like 120 like things to do um, and by the end of it because we just kept extending it so it started off this really neat chart of all neat lines and then sort of yeah. squiggly lines coming off at the end of it and it ended up being like over 200 and something by the end of it what we actually did and it was just because I would play a song in the studio just while we were waiting to do something and they, they were like where have you been sat on that we haven't demoed that let's do that and it was it kind of worked out like that but uh yeah, it's insanity what we actually did. <laughs> so Adam, we are we're still relatively early in 2024. I was going to ask what is the plans for the rest of the year, but I know the album's coming out. Mm. I had a look at the website, there's obviously lots of dates. I know you're up in Glasgow and Edinburgh on the 10th of May, so you've got a live in-store performance, uh, doing signings, but you're also going elsewhere uh, across... Yeah, the well, we're doing that. We're doing like a... Yeah, as, as with anything with us, we don't think do things traditionally, so we're doing um, a week prior to the release. We are doing an in-store run, uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh on the 10th of May, um, Manchester and Leeds on the 11th. Then it's all the way down to, um, going all the way down to release day, it's like Newcastle and Nottingham and Bristol, Oxford, uh, Big Show in London on the 16th on like, 
the evening of release, which so is midnight, and then um, ending in Southampton and Portsmouth on, on release day. And um, a few a few tiny little festivals and things, nothing major because we've never done a major festival uh, over the summer. And then we have a, a, I think it's like 25 date UK tour in um, September, October. And then that goes into Europe as well, which is like in the planning stage. So for a band that actually hasn't done like cause we've been very quiet this whole campaign just because um, we had a few issues with a few things. So come May, like so, like half this year we do nothing, and then the other half of the year I think we like we do like fifty shows. It's like it's stupid, but uh, it'll all be worth it, I'm sure. But uh, Adam, obviously, just before we go, um, we've been quite serious up to this point, so I'm going to end things with asking you a few fun questions. Yeah, go go for it, man. Shoot. Right. So. Imagine if you could pop back in time. Imagine you had a time machine. Imagine you could go back and attend any concert. What's the one concert you would love to have attended? Oh, that's a good one, that. Um, hmm. There's like loads that, you know, there's like loads that people always say are like the, the ones that everyone dreams of going to see and stuff like that. But for me, it's it's like something it has to be something that either has a personal meaning to me or I feel would be something that would be completely unforgettable not like the big ones or anything like that like my dad tells this good story about when he saw Led Zepp him and his mate because you know we were quite poor growing up and he was quite poor growing up he, him and his mate cut, cut holes cut a hole in a big tarpaulin that they nicked from a factory and used that as a, a rain mac and I would love to see my dad because my dad doesn't go to gigs or anything these days, so I'd love to see my dad go into uh, out a gig and join himself with his mate like that. But if it was me, it would be like something like seeing like Hendrix's like first appearance in London at a little pub, and uh, like something like that where you just you can see the you can see the future that's there, or like you know Johnny Cash at Folsom Prison or something like that. Like it's one of those. I mean, I've, I've asked a lot of people that question. A lot of them say live aid, and I understand why they say it, but someone had asked me back, like, what would I like to have seen? And uh, one of my favourite bands is The Doors. Mm. Now, they obviously, you know, such a big band. They played all these huge festivals and huge big arenas and stuff. I would love to have seen them see way before the first album came out, see when they played at the Whiskey. Mm. When they were there. And just before they became huge it yeah. would be amazing to see them but that's kind of what you were saying there you yeah know. i think it has it's like for me what i get from seeing bands even now is the inspiration factor because i can't turn off my music like cool brain so it's like when i watch a band now i just go like oh, what you've just done there is cool I, I enjoy that and like i kind of it's very rare for me to, to stand in front of a band and think yeah you're, you're a good band but when I do, it's because like I pay attention to everything, and I'm like absorbing it. Um, I've been I've been some great gigs, but yeah, if I was to go back in time, I, it would have to be something that I would be like inspired or would kind of be like, wow, like that is that is something that you'll you'll never see again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not like a, I'm not or or like you know someone like Robert Johnson when he used to play in all the Duke joints in America, like. Yeah. Because of the, the 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 folklore t- attached with like Johnson, it's like you know making a deal with the devil and all that. I'd, I'd, there's the you know I don't know how much you know about it, like that's the him, but like he yeah. he you know played in the Duke joints and he wasn't very good and he got shunned out and he disappears and he comes back and he he, he just is the best musician around and then he plays in the Duke joints facing away from the crowds and no one can see what he's doing and like. To be in that moment where you're in a juke joint and you've got a musician on stage and he's just doing something that you can't even witness because he's turned his back, that's in, that for me is like, what a moment, but uh, yeah, something like here's that. A, here's another question then for you, 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 you currently you're playing the guitar, you're, you're singing, is there another instrument that you wish that you could play? Piano, I kind of like, I kind of started teaching myself piano, self, self-teaching again. Yeah. And um, I've got this clip on my phone actually of me in the studio while we're recording this album, 
during the drums. Well, Tom was doing drums for like four days. I had nothing to do. So I was just like, what am I doing in the studio? Like, one run studio, looking through all the master tapes and stuff like that. And I found this piano at the bottom of the stairwell uh, for the apartment that we were staying in uh, above the studio. And um, it was completely out of tune. But like, I st sat down and I just started playing what felt right. And I, I wrote um, about a minute's worth of piano. And I don't know piano. I couldn't play it again today. I could yeah. not play it again today. Um, and uh, they could hear me in the studio. And they were like, was that you? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, you, you didn't tell us you played piano. I was like, I don't. Like, I really don't. So um, I wish I could play piano a little bit more. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, another question then now as you know there is millions of amazing songs that have been written and recorded over the years what's the one song that you wish you could have been in the studio to witness it being recorded um, there's a really good story about uh, there's a there's a Bowie song uh, or Bowie whatever you want to call, or however you want to pronounce it um when he was recording Golden Years, he was like living on a diet of cocaine and peppers. And <laughs> like, they say that you can hear it in that song. I, I would love to, I think it was like cocaine, peppers and milk he was living on. So I'd love to be in the studio with him and Iggy Pop when they were recording that, but, um, yeah, I mean, there's like, I think, like something that was just cut live, that was just like one of those live recordings that just happened. Um, there was, there's a really good recording from uh, Woodstock. Um, oh, I can't remember his name now. Uh, but it's, it's a song called Freedom. And he, um, oh, I'm gonna kick myself, I can't remember his name. But he basically made it up on the spot. He went out on stage and he um, he just started playing this, this song. And it's all recorded because it's the Woodstock. And he starts singing like, freedom, freedom. And it's like, he made that up on the spot. That's all ad-libbed. So to be there in that moment when you hear that song, that would have been good to yeah. to see that because like as if you even if even if you were a fan of his, you you wouldn't have known that song. Or to you know at the same gig when Santana went out on stage, he just dropped acid because he thought he was going out on stage the next day, uh, and he, he you know it's all recorded again. And there's a recording of him playing, and he he, he recalls thinking that his arms were like snakes while he was playing guitar. <laughs> so I'd love to have witnessed that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a really good question. They're, they're two really good questions, to be fair. And uh, la last question for you. Uh, who is your Mount Rushmore for bands? So who's the four bands or musicians that for yourself are just perfection? Um, damn. Uh, ooh. So I'm a, bit, I'm a big soul. I'm like I'm big. I'm a big soul guy. So there is uh, a couple of new artists actually that I think are just incredible. Um, but I'm gonna say like I'm gonna say Frankie Valley as one of them. Yeah. Um, just because you, you don't get a unique voice like that these days. So you know, to even when you, when, you, when I say Frankie Valley, I don't mean Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. I, I mean like Frankie Valley when he was singing "The Night," which became like a big Northern Soul like hit. You know what I mean? So it's like that is just perfection in terms of how different it is. But then like you know, the there's artists that like, I'm looking at my record shelf now that like. You probably couldn't say it because they're not very PC um, artists anymore. But like uh, Michael Kiwanuka, I think is an awesome musician. Um, I don't think he, he does. He, I don't think he's done anything that bad. Um, even like but Dan Auerbach and everything Dan Auerbach's ever done, from the Black Keys to the Arcs to the solo record to uh, his own record label Easy Eye, which is. If you've not if you've not heard of his own record label and any of the artists on that, they are some amazing artists that he just kind of picks up from like Nashville and different places, um, or even like the Jam. Like you think how like formative the Jam were for a lot of people, like bands like that. Um, but but then again, 
every band has their bad days. Even like, you know, even the Stones have their, have their bad days. And it's like a whole decade where you can't listen to the Stones because it's rubbish. But, um, but yeah, oh, I don't know, man. That, that's a really difficult question, actually. Yeah. It's a bit unfair just try to pick four. There's, there's that many good bands and musicians out there. You, you could... You could pick 20 and you'd still not be done, you know, it's... it's... Yeah, I mean, it's really good, like, for me, like, I'm big into, like, Afrobeat and stuff like that, and world music as well, so there's artists like Fela Kuti and, um, there's an, art, there's an artist called William Onyabor, which is, he's a really fun musician to listen to, because there's, you can't be sad, he, he has an album called Who Is William Onyabor, and you can't be sad listening to that album, and I've proved that, um, by... I had a friend who was going through the uh, same same period, same about the same time as me, going through uh, like a stage of grief, and he invited me around for a few drinks and stuff like that. And he was like, "Bring a few records, and we'll just chat." And I brought that one around, and I said, "This is the this is the record we're listening to first. Yeah. And he was like, "Who the f- is this?" And he's like a big like Oasis fan and Stone Roses and stuff like that. Um, and I was like, "Mate, just put this on and just <laughs> listen." You know what I mean? The front cover is is him. In a suit with a big cowboy hat, and he's like, I think, I think I'm pretty sure he's like Nigerian or something like that. And um, by the end of the album, he'd ordered it on Amazon to buy. It. So it was like, you can't, you can't not listen to that. But you know, if I was mentioning the Stone Roses as well, like from the, you know, their debut album is an album I never get bored of. So yeah, you could say I could say that as well. I could say them, but then the second album was Gash. So. Um, <laughs> Like, yeah, I don't know, man. Really difficult, really difficult. But it's a fun question to like theorise because it's like so many eyes. You could really, you could. I'll, leave, I'll, I'll leave you to ponder that. But Adam, thank you so much for coming on. It has been appreciated. I've enjoyed talking to you. And, yeah, uh, man. I look forward to your album coming out, and I, I do wish yourself and the band all the success in the future. Thank uh, you so much, man. Thank you for having me. Cool. And um, I'll keep a wee eye out um, next time. You are obviously up this this area. Um, if you look out, you might see me waving back at you. <laughs> yeah, man, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, you know, when, if you come down to the show or anything, like, let us know and we'll, we'll sort you out. Uh, so we've got, we've got a few Scottish dates that we're announcing for September, so um, in like that, proper venues. That's fine, mate. But Adam, enjoy the rest of the evening and uh, good luck in the future, eh? Thank you very much, man. You good too, help. and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you.